Oh, man. Oh, man, guys. Oh, man, guys. My tummy hurts. I ate too much candy. I didn't listen to my mom. I ate too much candy. And now my tummy hurts. Hey, folks. Welcome to Advisory. I hope you guys had a fun and safe Halloween last night. It was a great week here at school. It was really fun to see everybody dress up for Red Ribbon Week and for uh, Halloween yesterday. Very, very fun. Before we get started with our Red Ribbon Week finale, I wanted to make a couple of announcements. And the first is Feliz Dia de los Muertos. Today is the Day of the Dead. It marks the beginning of the Day of the Dead traditional celebrations. To celebrate here on campus, the Spanish Honor Society is putting together an ofrenda or an altar. This tradition comes from Mexico and it is a way to honor our ancestors that have passed away or passed on to the other side. And so the Spanish Honor Society is going to be putting together this ofrenda. You can submit folks that are in your family that have passed on or people that you want to honor by putting their picture on our collective WT White ofrenda. So scan, you can scan this little QR code over here and submit a picture of your loved one that you would like the Spanish Honor Society to print out and add to the ofrenda. Also, we have our fall blood drive coming up, and so Carter Blood Care will be here to receive blood donations on Friday from 9.30 in the morning to 4 p.m. If you'd like to sign up, you can do so in the lunchroom, and there you can find out all of the qualifications and how to sign up. If you donate blood, you get a cool shirt, and I think they give you like a cookie or something, and if you are a senior and you donate blood twice your senior year, you get to wear the red cord at graduation. And most importantly, the blood goes to patients in hospitals and other medical facilities that desperately need it. But those are my announcements. Today in advisory, we are going to be wrapping up Red Ribbon Week. We had a few videos this week about Red Ribbon Week. We talked about the fentanyl crisis. We talked about the history of the American drug trade. We talked about all sorts of stuff. And you all had several questions that you wanted answered in a video, and so that is also what I will be doing in this video. I also had an interview with Nurse Wolf that goes into great detail about the medical side of drugs, especially fentanyl. So here are those questions now. The first question is, why is raising awareness about drug usage so important? That's a good question. Why are we doing this at all? Why do we spend time talking to you about it? Why do we have it every year? And I think raising awareness, at least from advisory or from adults, is important because I think that a lot of times we get information from a ton of different places. And so raising awareness in a way that helps you be smart and safe is really what it's all about for me. Because otherwise, you just get the information from random places on the internet or your friends, and sometimes that is not the most reliable source of information. So my goal with this week, and what I think the ultimate goal of Red Ribbon Week is, is to give you the facts and give you the information that you need to be smart and be safe. The next question, why do people feel the only way to get away from reality is to do drugs? Why don't they stop when they know it may cause problems? You know, this first one is tough. There are lots of different answers to this question uh, of why people feel like, one, that they need to get away from reality, and two, that the only way to do that or the only way to escape the harder parts of reality is to do drugs. Maybe someone, that's all they know. That's all that they know or they watched the adults in their life or other people that they look up to in their life do drugs or they've seen it glorified as the way to escape from reality. And so they latch on to that without thinking about other more healthy ways. And while I think that to get away from reality is not the worst thing all the time, if you get away from reality and stay away from reality, meaning that you're always doing whatever it is that helps you escape from reality, then you're not existing in reality. You're avoiding life, and life sometimes can be hard not to try to avoid. So there are lots of ways why people use drugs specifically to get away from reality. Just like we talked with Miss Hill the other day about healthy and unhealthy coping skills, it is healthier to focus on the other coping skills that don't give you the problems and dependencies that drugs might give you. And as far as this second part of the question goes, the why don't they stop when they know it may cause problems, that is a question for all people. We all do some things that might cause us problems. I'm almost 32 years old and I love Wendy's. 
All right, I love the taste of Wendy's. I love how they make their burgers. I love the fries. I love it all. But as a 32 year old, if I only eat Wendy's all the time, then it's going to cause me problems. And I know that, but sometimes it's really hard to withstand the temptation to go to Wendy's. And maybe you have something like that in your life as well. Maybe it's a drug, but maybe it's something else that is consuming your life and causing some sort of problems. And so it really is just an internal thing where you have to sit and think, is this thing that I am doing helping me or is this thing that I am doing hurting me? And that comes with drugs and that also comes with video games, with food, with all sorts of things that we enjoy. But my encouragement to those folks would be to not shy away from reality, to deal with reality in a real way, because the life that is offered by drugs or these other things that we consume ourselves with is not real life. And the problems from reality will still be there after you come down off of whatever drug you're using to escape reality. Next question. Do you see the cartel members as the ones in the wrong? the members who were raised with that life and work with them to survive. And I was really taken with this question. Whoever asked this is a very thoughtful person, and so I'm going to try to give as thoughtful of a reaction as I can. This person is referencing a video that I showed you about the cartel that makes fentanyl in Sinaloa, Mexico. They're not the only place that makes fentanyl, but they are one of the main places that is exporting it to the US. And the news crew was able to get access to the actual lab and talk to the young men that are a part of the cartel and have been working there since they were young boys. And as was mentioned in that video, the boys that are raised in this culture in Sinaloa, where the cartel runs most of the city and the local governments and is tied into the businesses all around where these people grow up. When you're born into a situation like that, where that seems like, and you're told all your life that that is your only option, then it's very difficult to blame just the individuals who are making the product. Do I think they are to blame somewhat? Yes, because at the end of the day, we are all responsible for our own decisions. But they are by no means the only ones to blame, or I would say even the main ones to blame. The folks that run these cartels often instill fear into the town that they occupy. A fear that if you don't get in good with the cartel or work for the cartel, then you're not gonna get good employment or they could come after you. There's all sorts of considerations when it comes to these folks. And when that is the only way to make money in town, it's hard to blame just them. I would also blame America's drug use. And that is a whole thing. That's not just people that use drugs, but the system that got folks hooked on opioids in the last century, the overprescribing by doctors, the way that the sales of Oxycontin and other opioids shot through the roof because the pharmaceutical companies wanted to make a lot of money. Some of the blame is on the ineffective policies set out by governments, both in the countries that host the cartels and our country that has such a high demand for drugs and that has done not much but punish drug users and put them in jail. There's a lot of history in the Americas, both the United States of America and Central and South America, that has led us to where we are today. And so it's not just one policy and not just one government, but kind of the collection of all of them. And so no, it's not just the fault of the young men that get wrapped up into the cartel. It is partially their fault. But as with most things, it's not just one person's fault. It's not just black and white. There's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of nuance and things to consider when you think about who is at fault for the violence and the death that we see as a result of the drug trade. Because that ultimately is what is happening. It causes violence in the areas with the cartel. It causes violence in our cities here in America. Regardless of whose fault it is, drugs and violence have always gone hand in hand together. And it's important to take into consideration all of the things that cause that violence. Next question, how do we know if something is off with something that someone gives us? This is also a great question because inevitably you will find yourselves in a situation where there are drinks or where there are drugs or something like at a party or a gathering or somebody gives you something, it's very likely that you will someday be in a situation where you have to look at something that someone has given you and see if it's safe and wonder and think about if it's safe. 
The short answer to this question is you don't. There's no real way of knowing for sure if there's something wrong with something that someone gives you. Even if it's your trusted friend that got it from someone else, you don't know where that came from. That said, you should never take anything from someone you don't know or trust. Never put anything in your body, whether it's smoking or eating or drinking, whatever it is, you should never take something from someone you don't trust. If you're at a party or if you grow up even and go to a bar when you're 21, there's always a possibility, especially, unfortunately, for ladies, that someone can put something in your drink or give you something that is not going to give the effect that you think it is. So it's important to question everything that you put in your body, period. Because the thing is, as we've talked about and as we've seen, it only really takes one mistake, one thing that is laced with enough fentanyl or something equally dangerous, and you could get seriously hurt or even die. So the reality is you don't know if something is off. So Always err on the side of caution and question everything before ingesting it, taking it, doing anything like that. And when you're at parties, you're at a bar, keep your drink with you and keep it covered no matter who you are. Next question, how do you know if your friend has taken drugs and how can we know if a person is overdosing? When it comes to just having taken drugs, there's different signs if someone starts behaving differently or if they tell you that they've taken drugs often. That will happen, but I want to focus specifically on the signs around overdosing because this is information that could possibly save someone's life if they find themselves overdosing or if you see them overdosing. But I am definitely no expert, so for this part, I am going to go to our resident expert, Nurse Wolf, to talk a little bit more about overdosing and what to do in an overdosing situation. All right, folks, so I'm here with the amazing Nurse Wolf and she is uh, going to tell us a little bit more about the medical side of a couple of questions that I had about drugs. And so uh, first of all, Nurse Wolf, how long have you been a school nurse and how long have you been a school nurse at WT White? So I have been a school nurse for 16 years and my entire time has been at WT White. Amazing. I know. Wow. Once I came here, I couldn't leave. I love it so much. That's, so. That rules, I love that. And so you've seen a lot of stuff mm -hmm. over your time as a nurse in schools. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the kind of more serious cases, the overdose symptoms and things like that? What does an over, what is an overdose and like, what does an overdose look like to those of us that don't know? So the preliminary sign of someone that might be going into an overdose is the first is altered level of consciousness. So we're going to not being able to answer a question. So if I, you know, for the most part, people should know what's my name. If I'm asking someone, Hey, are you okay? Like, and they can't respond to me and I'm saying, what, what's your name? They can't answer, what's her name? What's the date? Where are you? Those are symptoms that something might be going on to the point where they might on the start of an overdose. Mm. So for an overdose, the first thing that we're gonna look for is they're probably going to be passed out and they're going to be, we're gonna shake them and they're not gonna be able to wake up at all. Like I'm shaking them, someone's sleeping, you should be able to like, they shake up, they will rouse a little right. bit. If I, but I'm shaking them and they're not waking up then I'm gonna be concerned. Mm -hmm. So you'll see people like on TVs, you'll see actual paramedics and stuff. We do what's called a sternal rub. So we take and we rub right here. Mm -hmm. And th this hurts. There is no fat here. There's right. no any kind of tissues. So when you do this, it is painful. <laughs> if I do this and they don't wake up, I'm really concerned. So uh -huh. at that point, that is our first sign of overdose. Second is um, they will, they're breathing. So a normal person breathes between 12, 20 breaths a minute. Someone who's overdosing will have very shallow breathing. They will be laying there and they will breathe a couple of times or they'll do what's called agonal breaths where they'll be like, mm. and at that point they're not getting good, good air. So we know there's another sign. Um, the third one would be, we look at the color of their skin. So if someone who's not getting good breath, that means their the blood in their body is deoxygenized. So they are turning blue. So mm -hmm. we'll look at their face. They'll kind of look a little gray tinge. The biggest thing is their lips. So if you look at someone's lips and they're like, I, they're kind of having purple lips at that point, there's another sign. Mm -hmm. um, pinpoint pupils, that is something that a lay person wouldn't know, but is another thing that we look for. Pinpoint meaning they're, they're very, very, very So they're very, very tiny. Yeah. So it looks like the, the tip of a pen. Yeah. So their, their pupils, the black parts of their eyes will be. Mm -hmm. that so at that point, we um, will... Uh, administer a naloxone. Yeah, and tell, tell, me, tell us about Narcan because uh, a lot of people may not know that this even exists. So Narcan is a drug that reverses opioid 
effects. So um, you the only thing that it can do is reverse opiate effects. It cannot cure anything else. So they give up. The nice thing about it, DISD now is part of a national program. We are trying to get, we have Narcan available in all of our schools, all of our field houses, any DISD location. Um, so we have opioid overdose kits. On campus, um, I carry one. There's also one that is in the AED, mm -hmm. right outside the attendance office, just with our AEDs and our Stop the Bleed kits. So inside, Narcan, the ones that are for laypersons, zoom in on this. look like a nasal spray. So if you have um, used a nasal spray at all, Afrin, any of that kind of stuff, it is the exact same thing. So you will take the nasal spray, you open up the package on the back side and you just insert it in their nostril and you give them a squirt. Mm -hmm. So at that point, the only thing it can re, uh, do is reverse our opioids. So if it's not an overdose, it's not going to have any effect on anything else. Um, so but, if you take it without being on other drugs, it doesn't do something to yeah. you. Mm -mm. So even it's safe to do if you're kind of wondering whether or not they might be overdosing, yes. but you're not sure. So yes. you can use this even if you're not sure and it will cover those. Mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. cool. So right now, our nurses, our police officers, we're all trained on it. Our staff now has got um, training. So it is very easy. It is something um, for outside people, students, parents, they can go online, they can do the training. This is available um, now over the counter. You can go to Walgreens, you can go to yeah. CVS, you can go to um, free websites, and they will send it right to your door. Mm -hmm. um, so they this will it binds with the opioids that's in your system and um, makes the effect reverses the effects of mm -hmm. the opioid overdose. Wow, I mean that's amazing that we even have that capability. Thank you, Nurse Wolf. So it's important to know the signs of an overdose and exactly what to look for and what to do in an event where someone might be overdosing. All right, next question is all about fentanyl. Why do they make fentanyl, and how many people die from fentanyl? Basically, the drug cartels have found that making this and often putting it in with other drugs without folks knowing, they can make their drugs that much stronger. And if you can make your drugs stronger for cheaper, then you have more incentive to put more fentanyl into the drugs. It's all about money. That's really what it comes down to. It all is about how can they make the most money possible. And as you can see in that video, a lot of the folks that are involved don't really think about anything other than the fact that it's a job. It makes money. And I don't care who is hurt from it or how many people die from it. So as far as why they make fentanyl, that is why. As far as the next question, how many people die from fentanyl, I want to go to this set of facts right here. Just a short video. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that is up to 50 times stronger than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine. In 2021, 70,601 people died from a fentanyl overdose in the U.S. That figure is up 25% from 2020, and it's nearly doubled the amount of fentanyl overdose deaths in 2019. Fentanyl overdose deaths in 2021 were over 26 times higher than the decade prior. Since 2012, fentanyl overdose deaths have increased every year. Fentanyl is responsible for more than half of all yearly opioid overdose deaths since 2017. In recent years, deaths from fentanyl overdose rose sharply, overtaking deaths from prescription opioids and heroin. So fentanyl is really scary. So we've always had, you know, uh, when we're having issues with opioids, heroin and stuff, it had to be someone where you had to choose to ingest it. You had to actually do it. Fentanyl is one that can be ingested through the skin. Mm. So if you think that, you know, a lot of people overdose because they think they're getting an oxycodone and instead it's laced with fentanyl. So if you go and you touch fentanyl, I can touch, I can get uh, a reaction and have an overdose and it can go into my system just by touching it. Mm. So that's really scary for um, users. It's scary for healthcare professionals because again, we, if we go and grab a drug when we're not wearing um, gloves, we can actually have the in our system. So fentanyl is used as a sedative. It is used normally in the hospital setting. It is to put you to sleep. When you're going into a surgery, you get a fentanyl drip or you're in a coma, they put you on a fentanyl drip to keep you sedated, keep you monitored. Fentanyl, you don't know how much is in it. So a lot of times someone might think that they're taking an oxycodone pill or they think they're taking a Xanax pill or they're taking something, but 
they don't know, they haven't got it from an actual prescription bottle mm -hmm. and is laced with fentanyl. And in one dose, one dose can kill you. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think that's the most important thing. Have you noticed a, um, like kind of an increase in fentanyl related things mm -hmm. in the district or even at school? Most definitely. So we, up until last year, we, the district, we have not had fentanyl doses. Fentanyl was not something that we were, was on our radar. We had heard about things from, you know, other parts of the country were starting to have it. Um, and it has now become localized. So we have had it in the district, we've had cases of possession of fentanyl. We have cases of overdose of fentanyl. Um, so it is now something that the district is taking now a proactive stance and like we are going to have Narcan on, Narcan on our campuses. We're going to train our staff members. We're going to try to get the word out by having, talking to students, having um, assemblies, having presentations to parents to try to get on top of the so. Because again, it's something that is so new that people don't know a lot about right. and we need to get the word out. Right. All right. Thank you once again to Nurse Wolf. And so the important takeaways here are that fentanyl is a relatively new thing, which is why you hear so much about it from us, which is why you hear more and more about it every year, is because if you look at the data, it has spiked dramatically from 2013 all the way up to 2021. This is a new and unknown and scary thing. Most of these deaths, as it says, are from fentanyl, and most of those deaths were accidental overdoses because the person thought that they were taking one drug and instead it had fentanyl in it. And this is a big part of why we're doing what we're doing with Red Ribbon Week is because this is a crisis. They call the opioid crisis now an epidemic because of how many opioids are out on the streets and how many more folks are dying every year as a result of them. The last question is, what should you say to a friend that does drugs? And the fact is that while you can be a friend and you can try to do your best to talk to them and ask them on a personal level maybe why they're doing what they're doing and see if there's some way that you can help them. The best way to help them is quite often getting them help from a professional, from a counselor, from an adult, especially at this age. As a friend, you want to be there for someone who is struggling with drugs as a non-judgmental, safe place, but you also want them to be safe and healthy. And so I think the best thing that you can do is to get them help and let them know that the reason that you want to get them help is because you care about them and you care about their safety. Oftentimes, if someone is struggling with addiction or doing some drugs, just knowing that someone is there as a friend can go a long way. And folks, that has been our Red Ribbon Week. But I wanna leave you with these considerations. I know we've talked about a lot of specifics, but these are the big three things that I want you to take away from what we've talked about in Red Ribbon Week. And that is, number one, be smart, all right? It goes back to being careful with what you put in your body, not trusting certain things that you don't know where they came from, having the information about fentanyl, about opioids, about drug use, about the different things that different drugs do to your body, that is what being smart is. If you go into doing drugs or some sort of drug situation without this knowledge, the risk of you getting hurt or even killed goes up dramatically. So before you get involved with anything, think and be smart and be intentional with what you're doing. Number two is be safe. This has everything to do with being careful with where you're getting things that you take, how you're taking them, what you're doing, how often you're taking them. Being safe also involves not getting behind the wheel when you are in any way inebriated on drugs or alcohol. Being safe means thinking about not only your own safety, but the safety of those around you. And number three, think about the future. Somebody asked earlier why people use drugs to get away from reality. And another answer to that question is immediate gratification, meaning that someone that takes drugs knows that they will get a good feeling right now out of that drug that they are taking. If we get used to taking drugs as a coping mechanism, then oftentimes that immediate gratification that we feel is what we go after more and more and more and more. So when you're deciding to do or not do something, Try to think about more than just what you're feeling right now. Think about what is beyond the present moment and how what is happening now may affect your life in the future. All right, and that does it for Red Ribbon Week for 2024. I hope you guys learned a lot. I hope you guys were able to get some tools in your tool belt to deal with drugs, whether you are struggling with them yourself or if you know someone who is. But that's all from me for this week. Have a great weekend. Be good to yourself and others, and I'll see you on Monday.